So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We'll make a start. Um, welcome to the Centre for Governance and Public Policies uh, seminar series here at Griffith University. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands upon which we're joining in from today. In my case, it's the Yugambeh and Bunjalung people. Um, I'm, I'm on the border of their country and happens to be the border of New South Wales and Victoria as well, uh, New South Wales and Queensland as well. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to, uh, to the traditional owners and to um, all uh, leaders in our First Nations communities, um, past, present and emerging and extend that those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present in particular. Um, my name's AJ Brown. I'm the program leader in, in public integrity and anti-corruption research, which is one of the uh, research streams in the Centre for Governance and Public Policy here at Griffith. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today to uh, our seminar series, um, and particularly to welcome Mark Tushnet from uh, Harvard Law School, who is our very special guest speaker uh, today, joining us uh, in his evening from Boston. Um, and uh, just before we get going, um, I also wanted to welcome a few external guests that we've got joining in uh, today. Um, I can see Adam Graycar from uh, the University of Adelaide, our, our colleague and former colleague. Um, also Lewis Rangott, who's from the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption here in Australia. And we may well have a few other distinguished guests as well. So uh, looking forward to everybody contributing to the discussion um, and a good turnout of faculty colleagues and, uh, and our graduate students. Um, so I'm hoping we'll have plenty of, of good discussion once we get going. Just to let you know, we are recording the session today. It will be available on our website um, so you can tell all your friends about it. Um, and um, what we'll do uh, is, um, is, is Mark will speak to us, with us, um, for about 30 minutes, um, and then there should still be plenty of time for questions and discussion. So please do indicate in the chat box um, if you'd like to ask a question, just write question or comment and question, um, and, uh, or, or put up your hand. Um, you can also put your question in the chat box if you like. Uh, but we'll save all the questions until uh, until the uh, second half of proceedings um, today. Um, the uh, it, it's a great honour to introduce Mark um, because uh, uh, not only is the book uh, his new book that he's going to be speaking to us about today uh, very very important in my view and in, in the view of many, um, but but uh, Mark Tushnet himself is. Um, uh, one of the world's most distinguished constitutional lawyers, law academics and constitutional theorists. Um, he's, he's been part of an amazing sweep of history. Um, he was a law clerk in the US Supreme Court um, back in 1972-73 to the first African-American justice of the Supreme Court, um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, as, which was also the period of the famous Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision that that uh, everybody around the world is is uh, pretty knowledgeable of. Um, but um, since then, uh, Mark has spent most of his career as a constitutional lawyer, academic and theorist. Um, he's the William, William Nelson Cromwell Professor Emeritus of Constitutional Law at Harvard. Um, he's written many, 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 many books. Um, uh, but I, I do hope that, that this, his most recent book published by Cambridge University Press, the the new fourth branch, Institutions for Protecting Constitutional Democracy. I'm actually hoping, Mark, it'll be one of your most important uh, books <laughs> for all the reasons that we'll discuss. Um, uh, and I also noticed, Mark, Wikipedia says that, uh, uh, that you were um, part or are part of the critical legal studies movement, um, but typ typically of Wikipedia, it always, it also says citation needed for that. <laughs> So, so you can tell us whether, in fact, uh, that's that's correct or not. Um, so, without further ado, um, I will I will hand over to Mark to talk about about his new book, the new uh, the new fourth branch. I mean, from Australia and in Australia, um, we've we've had some experimentation and we've made some contribution. I think in terms of thinking about 
the constitutionalization and the constitutional trajectory of a whole range of institutions beyond the traditional three branches. The constitute our state constitution of Victoria, um, which which uh, many people know is the traditional engine room of de democracy in Australia, um, is the closest to having started to constitutionalize a number of institutions that uh, beyond the three traditional branches. Uh, but but um, but Mark's new book is very much a global picture um, uh, and snapshot of of what is happening with these institutions where, and where they fit in. So it's it's a great pleasure to uh, to welcome you, Mark, and to hand over to you to talk about your book. And you just let me know when you would like me to start sharing your slides. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I, I appreciate the invitation, uh, particularly coming from Professor Brown. <coughs> Excuse me who is, in my view, one of the, I have to say this sort of immodestly, few people who have tried to conceptualize the fourth branch uh, more generally. Uh, I, I wanted to say a bit about how I ran across his work. Uh, I've been doing some stuff on thinking about uh, uh, these new institutions, focusing primarily on anti-corruption, uh, agencies in Brazil and South Africa and and was doing a sort of a, a web search for uh, literature uh, on it that on on the fourth branch topic that went beyond focus on anti-corruption itself. Uh, of course there's very large literature as you know on anti-corruption and, and designing anti-corruption institutions. Um, uh, but Professor I, I couple of articles, uh, one I think unpublished at least then speech uh, by Professor Brown uh, was one of the very few things that said, well, you know, there are these things that are sort of like anti-corruption agencies that we ought to be thinking about uh, as part of what I call the new, the new fourth branch. Um, and so his, his work was, I think, some of the earliest that was uh, conceptualizing this, uh, in my view, uh, more broadly and more appropriately. Um, uh, could you put up the first screen, the screen of the uh, um, slideshow, the cover of the book? Okay, so uh, Professor Brown asked me to say something about the cover of the book, the cover photo on the book. Uh, I want to say, uh, and you'll see, he's uh, done a blurb for this. Um, I, I want to say that uh, I myself didn't come up with this photo. Uh, it was presented to me, among others, by the uh, designers at Cambridge University Press, and as soon as I saw it, I thought it was the right thing. Um, this is a sculpture called Warriors, uh, uh, and you can sort of see why they are standing with, it sort of looks like uh, spears. Um, and it's located in what's known as the Plaza of the Three Powers uh, in Brasilia. Um, Brasilia, of course, was a design city as the um, capital, new capital of Brazil. And uh, uh, the designer, who I believe of this space was Oscar Niemeyer, uh, thought that, well, first of all, placed the major um, buildings for the apexes of the three branches at one end of a very large mall. Um, so what you're seeing here is the, I believe it's the, uh, executive branch house. Uh, um, uh, it's not the president's house, the president lives elsewhere, but this is the executive offices of the uh, government of Brazil. And I think it's to the right is the uh, legislature and to the left is the Supreme Federal Court. Uh, and what the designer said, well, we ought to have in front of this um, a plaza of the three powers, which could be a place where Brazilians could uh, assemble uh, and act collectively as people uh, uh, to 
demonstrate uh, about matters of public importance. Uh, now, as I understand it, the plaza, partly because Brasilia is not a very great city uh, for people to come to, uh, hasn't functioned all that well in that kind of way. Uh, although apparently last week, President Bolsonaro uh, had a very large um, demonstration of his supporters uh, characterized as uh, portending the possibility of a coup, which is sort of inconsistent with the idea that this would be a vehicle for uh, a location for uh, expressing uh, democracy. Okay, so that's the that's the picture. The next slide uh, begins the uh, my talk. Uh, before I uh, launch into it, though, I do want to make it clear that I regard this book as uh, a, a preliminary, as uh, nothing, nothing like definitive. Uh, I think of it as opening a conversation, and I'm completely comfortable with corrections, modifications, uh, and the like. Um, uh, this is a new discussion because uh, there's a, been a proliferation of these institutions. Uh, it's not to say there's no history, uh, but the history is thin. So in the 17th century, uh, audit courts uh, were uh, constitutionalized in the Netherlands. Um, uh, I, I didn't have this in, in the uh, outline. Uh, uh, ombuds offices, uh, which were originally attached to parliaments, uh, um, but sort of gradually became extruded as independent institutions. Uh, the South African ombudsperson is a constitutional office uh, which played a very significant role in some anti-corruption efforts uh, in, in South Africa. Um, and it turns out that for my larger argument, the, the extrusion of ombuds office from parliament to an independent body is sort of important. Uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, designed a constitution with five, what they were called, yuan branches. The control yuan was a blend of an audit bureau and an electoral management body and an impeachment uh, body. Um, uh, much later in this, that's in the 1920s, I believe, uh, in the late 1980s, Roberto Unger came up with this utopian vision of new branches, uh, including a very, I think, interesting idea of what he called a destabilization branch, uh, which, because it's utopian, has never gone anywhere. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the century, Bruce Ackerman, uh, in uh, um, an article called, I believe, The New Separation of Powers, had a brief discussion of the possibility of uh, a, an integrity branch. Um, uh, given, its, given the role of this discussion in subsequent uh, uh, scholarship, I was actually surprised when I went back to look at what Ackerman had to say. Uh, it's a very short discussion. Uh, I think it's like two pages in a 90-page article. And interestingly, it is focused on street-level corruption with the Hong Kong and Singaporean cases most clearly in mind. Now, street-level corruption is an important phenomenon for con or eliminating street-level corruption is important to uh, bolster public confidence in the integrity of government, which helps stabilize democracies. But it uh, um, uh, it's it turns out street level corruption is only a small part of the problem. And the Hong Kong and Singaporean examples, which were the cases that Ackerman, I think, pretty clearly had in, had in mind, have their peculiarities in ways that I hope I'll be able to get to later. Um, but in addition, we now know that what has come to be called apex corruption, high level corruption, is in many ways much more damaging uh, to stabilizing democracy. Um, and, and one way you can see that is actually it's from Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. Um, uh, very authoritarian governments uh, can be perfectly comfortable 
be aggressively uh, policing street level corruption while tolerating apex corruption uh, as well. Um, and so uh, an integrity branch that focuses only on street level corruption doesn't get at uh, all the, um, the um, matters of concern. Now I've started to use the language, I think I should go to the next slide. Um, yeah, um, so uh, the integrity, I've started to use the language of integrity branch, which is probably the most common um, I think it's the one that's most used in Professor Brown's work, for example. But I think that people have come to realize that it's incomplete. Um, it works for anti-corruption agencies and audit bureaus. Uh, it doesn't work for electoral, or, and it does work for certain aspects of electoral management bodies. Um, uh, it's an awkward fit. Not impossible. Integrity is an awkward trick for ombuds offices where the issues are not, at least typically, corruption, but bureaucratic inertia. Uh, and it's a, an even worse fit. Integrity is a language that doesn't work well for other institutions that have come to be grouped uh, with the uh, anti-corruption and electoral management bodies, such as human rights commissions and environmental agencies. And something I talk about briefly in the book, um, central banks, which I think actually do fit into the conceptualization uh, of these uh, branches, but are typically dealt with, not surprisingly, by scholars who focus on entirely different aspects of governance, that is fiscal management, uh, and and uh, uh, monetary policy. Um, what what links these uh, together? Uh, well, uh, my argument in the book is that the central in, uh, central missions of these institutions uh, deal with uh, what I call intratemporal and intertemporal conflicts of interest. I won't say much about the intertemporal conflicts of interest, uh, except to note that uh, they are the ones that um, uh, generate the idea for central banks and uh, environmental agencies. The basic idea is that today's policymakers don't have incentives or good incentives to take into account fully the impact of their decisions on future generations. So what they do now uh, will disregard the consequences of what will happen later. Um, the intratemporal, uh, oh, and, and finally, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, conflict of interest component, there is some component of specialization, um, which emerges primarily when uh, uh, people started thinking about, uh, well, maybe we can use constitutional courts to do some of this stuff. Uh, that's quite common with electoral management issues. Um, but then came to realize that no, um, it was sort of better to, at least if you could, uh, create independent institutions, independent of the uh, constitutional court. <clears throat> uh, I, now I'm going to focus on the intratemporal uh, conflicts of interest, and, and the next slide is uh, uh, where I start with this. Um, the idea is that uh, these are new institutions, uh, and the reason is, is that uh, for a long time it, it didn't seem as if any specialized institutions beyond the classical three. Uh, were needed to guarantee democracy. Uh, my language, as you see, I use Madisonian as, as the term, is drawn from US constitutional history, uh, but the basic idea uh, isn't uh, distinctive to the US. Uh, the Madisonian argument has two components. Uh, um, first, um, a large degree of integrity and the things we're looking for can be achieved simply by the public public spirited action 
of public officials by civic virtue. Um, roughly speaking, civically minded people, uh, public officials don't want to act corruptly and they don't want to steal elections. Um, but as uh, Madison says, um, enlightened characters, that is people with public, public virtue, uh, will not always be in control. So you needed to supplement uh, civic virtue with something else. I, I do want to note that civic virtue is, remains a significant component of uh, how we should think about these uh, issues. But as I'll say later, uh, uh, it's less significant now than the Madisonian argument took it to be. So second, when public spirit fails, we had the separation of powers uh, and it worked to ensure integrity because as he put it, ambition would counteract ambition. The interests of the man, that is the occupant of uh, uh, the office, uh, would, would uh, correspond to the interests of the place, the office itself. Um, so uh, uh, possible corruption in the executive branch uh, would be policed by a legislature alert uh, to preserving its own role in governance. Legislators would challenge executives who bribed either, either voters or other legislators because bribery would undermine the ability of the legislature to defend itself uh, against um, overreaching by the executive. And in parallel, possible cor corruption in the legislative branch would be policed by an executive uh, who would challenge legislators who sought corruptly to influence executive officials. Um, um, I should know nobody talked much about judicial corruption, but I think the Madisonian uh, argument works there as well. Both executive and legislatures have uh, an interest in making sure the judges don't take bribes to resolve cases. Uh, I do want to note, because I've worried about this um, since I wrote the book and decided I didn't spend enough time on the following point in the book. Uh, in my view, the Madison argue, Madisonian argument wasn't airtight, uh, even on its own terms. Um, uh, I have it here as it wasn't a completely satisfactory account because the incentives argument didn't quite uh, work, I think, uh, as effectively as uh, Madison thought it would. Although I do want to note it had some significant support in um, uh, prior British constitutional history. Okay, next slide. Um, as we all know, uh, uh, the Madison argument doesn't capture how contemporary institutions work. Uh, the first premise uh, about public spiritedness is in officials is uh, denied by public choice scholars. Uh, that is, it's just assumed away. Uh, it's derided by so-called sophisticated observers of politics. Uh, uh, although I have to say that in my fairly limited con uh, contacts with um, sitting members of Congress and senators in the United States, there's more public spiritedness in, in them than uh, you would think simply on reading uh, sophisticated, sophisticated accounts in the newspapers. And uh, finally, though, probably not enough. Um, uh, so public spiritedness has declined. Um, uh, um, the second premise is where all the pressure comes. Uh, um, the traditional branches, I, I quote the uh, now classic article by uh, Richard Pildes and Daryl Levinson about the US constitutional uh, system. We now have the separation of parties, not the separation of powers. The traditional branches protect party interests rather than the interests of the branches uh, as such. Um, so consider uh, the case where the executive branch and the legislature are controlled by the same party. 
the incentives to investigate corruption or to prevent electoral uh, uh, manipulation are misaligned. Executives and the legislative majority will investigate their, op their opponents for corruption and overlook their own corruption. And absent very particular um, and turns out not terribly effective mechanisms of constitutional design, the legislative and majority uh, minority uh, uh, will not be able to do much uh, to uh, uh, protect themselves against uh, politicized uh, investigations or uh, publicized uh, uh, corruption, as like by the uh, majority party. Now, I call this a problem of intratemporal conflict uh, of interest. The body is designed uh, to protect um, uh, democracy don't have an incentive to do so. As I said, they uh, will protect party members no matter where they are located. Uh, I do note briefly in the book that sometimes there are problems of convergence of interest as when major parties collaborate to squeeze out rising competitors uh, or where uh, um, uh, uh, a permanent minority accepts its a uh, subordinate position in exchange for payoffs, uh, sinecures uh, that uh, would be threatened if they uh, aggressive, aggressively uh, challenged uh, the dominant party's uh, corruption uh, and, and the like. Um, uh, uh, here at Singapore is, I think, an interesting case of that. Um, um, the um, recent um, Kenyan decision uh, about uh, uh, modification of the Kenyan constitution deals with a situation where the majority and minority parties strike a deal to squeeze out a rising competitor. Now, back to the new institutions. And uh, next slide, thanks. Um, uh, these new institutions are designed to deal with problems of conflict of interest by uh, by creating an institution or, as we now know, more than one uh, that somehow is above party politics. Um, uh, I, I use a language, and I think other people do, of uh, transcending or being above party politics. Uh, Tarun Katane's got a very important article um, that uh, converges with but diverges from my argument in, in interesting ways, uh, where in which he uses the term beyond party uh, interests or beyond party politics. Um, um, my uh, my concern. Tarot has has a, approaches these issues from a, a different, uh, um, much more normative perspective than I do. And I add into mine and, and something that I think he undervalues, which is these institutions have to transcend party interests, but they has to be they have to be sustainable politically. Uh, and uh, there are um, uh, to accomplish that, uh, they have to have, I think, three, characteristics. Um, independence, uh, to be above or beyond politics, accountability, to be politically sustainable, and various forms of expertise. Again, Tarun emphasizes the expertise point uh, in order to distinguish these institutions from the constitutional court. Um, uh, I won't discuss constitutional courts here. Uh, um, Early on, constitutional courts were, were used as these institutions, and sometimes they still are. Um, I, I think I, I, and Professor Brown has the statistics on this somewhere, but I think it's uh, roughly one third of the institutions doing electoral management of some sort are constitutional courts. 
uh, um, there's a important paper by uh, Tom Ginsburg and, and um, um, Tom Melton, for, I'm getting his first name wrong, Ginsburg and Melton on the collateral uh, jobs, of, ancillary jobs of constitutional courts. Many constitutional courts have electoral management as, um, as a, um, uh, an ancillary task. Um, some uh, constitutional courts do anti-corruption investigations directly. The most interesting, although it's a terrible design, is the Brazilian Federal uh, uh, Supreme Court, which has exclusive jurisdiction over tr uh, charges of criminality against sitting legislators, uh, which means that no, the, the statistic is sort of widely bandied about. Uh, at one point, uh, one third of the members of the Brazilian parliament had cases in the Supreme Court where they were subject to trial, investigation and trial, ordinary trial um, by the Supreme Court. Now, uh, the Brazilians are trying to do something about that because uh, uh, it's a terrible way to design. Um, um, one problem with assigning these issues to constitutional courts is that, uh, well, twofold. One is sometimes a lack of expertise uh, and sometimes a potential of excessive uh, politicization uh, or the uh, uh, juridification of high politics, uh, which has various kinds of consequences. Now, there, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm not going to to talk about the design possibilities for these institutions. There are many possibilities, um, which I talk about in one chapter in the book, and I'm not going to go through them. Uh, this part of the talk wraps up by saying, look, I think I've laid out what I view as the institutional and uh, political uh, um, logic for creating fourth branch institutions. Um, I have like five minutes left, I think, and I do, do, do want to talk about uh, the potential pathologies of these institutions. Uh, they're captured by the idea of mission commitment uh, and mission creep. Um, so uh, um, the mission commitment point is you get anti-corruption investigators. Their job is to find, invest find corruption, and they will do so. Uh, even when doing it is um, not good for preserving constitutional democracy. Um, I have a view uh, about this in connection with the Brazilian case where there was enormous apex corruption. There's no question about it. But the capstone of the prosecution was the prosecution of uh, Lula the former president and leading candidate for uh, election at the time of the investigation. Um, and the charge against him was uh, tenuous uh, as a matter of law, maybe factually and legally supportable, but uh, prosecutorial overreach, um, probably uh, overreach. I should note, Brazilians think that what he was charged with was only the tip of the iceberg, that there was a lot of other stuff that they couldn't prove against him. But what he was charged with was a very uh, attenuated uh, act of corruption, if at all. Um, and the Brazilian case also illustrates the problem of politically biased enforcement of anti-corruption laws, um, uh, where, where, well, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, in, in the electoral management uh, area, um, you get these independent people who think that there is a science of electoral management, uh, and that leads them to have a vision of what good political campaigns look like, uh, and they try to discipline the campaigns to fit those, uh, uh, fit those uh, characteristics. Uh, in the book, I talk about the Indian case where, you know, at least for a while, uh, a quite effective electoral management body, uh, which adopted for maybe 15 or 20 years, 
a completely um, unsuitable vision of politics that had uh, actually a political bias, although I think it was not adopted for uh, uh, ideologically biased reasons. Um, it gets characterized as a middle class vision of politics in contrast with a turbulent street politics of uh, uh, that they were trying to uh, control. Um, uh, mission creep is expansion beyond the core conflicts of interest rationale. Uh, um, and, and again, you can see that in, in anti-corruption actions. Uh, and then finally, uh, there is this problem of intertemporal conflicts of interest, which are real. Uh, and that you do want to have some way of addressing. Uh, but it's not at all clear um, what the best way of doing so is, whether creating uh, separate institutions um, is, is, a, um, or is, is, is a good way of uh, doing that. Uh, so central banks are, are sort of the chief example where their focus on avoiding inflation leads them to be less attentive to current distributional consequences of their decisions. Uh, and as I say here, almost any policy can be recharacterized as implicating conflicts over time. Sort of libertarians are, are experts at uh, doing that uh, through the use of public choice kinds of models. Um, and so um, uh, uh, there's a real problem in, uh, in, in trying to figure out the scope of these institutions. Now, finally, I have, I'm, I'm over by one minute, so let me just take one last uh, minute to do this. Um, uh, whether these uh, things are successful or not needs much more study. Uh, and, and there is a problem in the field, which is that people who investigate these bodies typically although not always in political science, but more, much more in, in law, typically want them to succeed. Um, and so they look for success and see it where it might not, not actually uh, be uh, happening. Um, uh, the characterization of South Africa as a successful example is for me quite questionable, for example. Uh, so I think the First point is, is figuring out what success is and seeing when it occurs and what are the conditions under which it occurs needs uh, much more study. Uh, my view is that uh, the difficulties of success are associated with the structure of party systems. Um, roughly speaking, in a dominant party system, it's going to be very hard for these institutions to work successfully, although here. There's a certain amount of randomness, uh, even in dominant party systems, uh, uh, which the South African story is, is one. Um, and uh, similar difficulties in, in what I call chaotic party systems like Brazil, uh, where, uh, where the, these agencies can do things, uh, can do things within their mission uh, and do them well, but have no effect whatever. Uh, on the overall uh, system of governance. Um, and my final point is that these systems, these institutions probably work best where you have competitive two party or three or four party stable uh, party systems. Um, and my intuition is that they probably do work best there, but also Madisonian mechanisms would work uh, well there. Uh, so my sort of bottom line quasi cynical conclusion is that these institutions are likely to work best in party systems where they are needed least. Um, uh, and that's, um, you know, and, and they're likely to work badly in systems where they're most needed. Okay, so that's the basic outline. And I welcome uh, discussion. Well, thank you enormously, Mark. Um, so many questions and so uh, many interesting implications. And uh, um, 
and uh, a wonderful book and um, so much, such a big departure point for, for so much thinking and research and, and politics and action. Um,